Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Ganey. I'm an engineer on the Pulp team. I've been on Pulp for about five years now. And uh, my talk today is about some plans the Pulp team has on moving from Pulp 3 to Pulp 4. Uh, and as you can see from the slide here, the very first rule of this talk, especially to anyone that lived through the Pulp 2 to Pulp 3 transition is, don't panic, <laughs> we've got your back. All right. So here's today's agenda. Assuming everybody, uh, Kieran, stop that. Today's agenda introduction, uh, which I just did. We're going to talk about why are we proposing a new version? What kinds of things might change? How are we thinking about approaching this? When might you start seeing some of the uh, effects here? And then uh, some things we haven't given a lot of thought to yet, but need to, and then just a review. Now, this talk is scheduled for an hour. I do not have an hour of material here. Uh, the idea was to give this introduction to the community and then leave time for Q&A and brainstorming and get a feel for what people are thinking. Um, so this is not an hour's worth of tech talk. This is uh, very early days and we are soliciting um, uh, opinions and brainstorming and ideas as early as we can uh, in order to make this potential process as painless as possible. So again, and you're going to hear me say this a lot, don't panic. <laughs> Let's move on. First question, why? Why are we even talking about this? So uh, Pulp 3 has been out for, I believe, three years now. It's been in use in a lot of different places. Um, we have made a lot of changes to it, and we've also learned both from the changes we've made and from input from you and the community about things that work, things that don't work, things that were perhaps over-engineered, under-engineered, whatever. We've learned a lot of lessons. Um, we have a promise for our REST API to our community that we will not make significant changes to the REST API that will break your workflows. Modulo, obviously, uh, flat out bugs. Um, however, that makes some changes that we would like to make impossible because they would require changes to the API that would make it backwards incompatible. We do not want to break your workflows. That's goal one. Uh, but we do want to make Pulp better. Uh, and so that's, that's the tension that we are dealing with uh, right now. One of the lessons, the major lessons we learned from the Pulp 2 to Pulp 3 process was that changing everything all at once is a really bad idea. And it it's a lot of work on the Pulp team. It's a huge impact to our community. Um, and it never goes as well as you want. Uh, so the idea here is, can we come up with a process for moving from Pulp 3 to Pulp 4 that is focused on a small number of important changes that is consumable by the community, by the users of Pulp, people who already have workflows, you already have scripts, there are products that build Pulp into it, uh, that is consumable uh, in a way that doesn't um, uh, cause discontinuities in your uh, production systems. And that is repeatable because the goal is a focused set of changes today, and then maybe next year, another set of focus changes that would be the next the next release of pulp down the road um, and that's the the goal is to make it to make make it possible for us to make changes like this in pulp in a repeatable way that doesn't break the whole community so what are we thinking of changing that focused set of changes right now there are four things we would like to do that would have an impact on the Pulp 3, the version 3 API in non-backwards compatible ways. The first thing is to replace uh, the places where Pulp uses hrefs with PRNs. Uh, the, uh, Jared, help me out here. I just spaced on what PRN stands for. Um, the problem- Pulp resource name. Pulp resource name, thank you. The problem with hrefs is they know things, an href contains information about where your your API root is. And that's a thing that, that um, sites want to change. 
And once you change it, all your hrefs are wrong. And that just breaks your, your system. And it's a really hard thing to deal with. PRNs are stable. And that has a huge impact on the ability to run a, a pulp instance long term. Um, it just makes things a lot better for the user. Um, and that, that has an impact on the API. The second thing is we want to make domains just be part of pulp. There, it's not, it won't be switchable. You'll just have domains enabled. Um, that affects a lot of URLs, obviously. Um, pulp resource names. Kieran, uh, PRNs are Pulse re resource names, and they're already in use in a number of places. If you look in, for example, task output, uh, reserved created resources are come with both hrefs and PRNs. Um, so we're already implementing them. What we want to do is replace hrefs completely as opposed to use either dual use or uh, have places where hrefs exist and PRNs do not. Um, as far as domains go, as Jared pointed out in his talk, there is work for us to do. We've got to get all the plugins domain enabled first. But once they are, we'd like to make it so that in pulp, domains are always turned on. If you don't have any, then you just have the default domain. But there's a lot of things that get a lot simpler in pulp if we don't have to maintain the, the, dual, um, the dual configuration of you could or could not have domains. Uh, another thing that we're working on changing here is um, right now all of our RBAC policy is configured in the Python code and stored in the database. It makes it difficult to change. It makes it difficult to understand what's going on. It's hard on the installations to, to um, uh, have their own setup for RBAC. Um, and we want to move all that policy configuration out of the database and into a place where it's more accessible and more consumable, I guess, by admins. Um, Anybody who, uh, on the pulp team who wants to chime in here and make sure I'm staying on the straight and narrow with that, please do raise your hand or something. And the last thing that we want to do with pulp four is we want to remove the APIs accessible to end users that give you direct artifact access. Our experience has been the fact that content that the binaries are deduplicated. Um, and exist as artifacts and not with you know naked artifacts um, really is confusing to the to the pulp workflow to users it has caused a lot of issues in terms of people misunderstanding how to how to use pulp um, and a lot of confusion in uh, in terms of support so what we'd like to do is uh, replace uh, and remove all of the direct artifact access API certainly from the general user um, I could imagine discussion about, yeah, but admins need to be able to get at that for, for reasons. That's fine. But the general use API, you just know about content in repositories. That's it. Those are the four changes we are talking about right now. Um, I, maybe we could add one. But right now, this is, this is what we want to focus on as if we really were to release a pulp four today, these are the four things that we would want to, the breaking changes we would want to make to the API. Questions? Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, as a user, is there a way for me to track the work um, for Pulp 4? Like, um, GitHub issues with a label would be great, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea. Um, I think actually, we'll create a milestone, probably, right? Yes. Hey, Dennis, since, since you chimed up here, can I voluntold you for, to do a thing for me, please? Sure. Could you somewhere, it doesn't matter where, just jot down suggestions that people make as we go along here. That would be great. Okay. And then we can yep. we can Sounds capture good. them. Outstanding. Thank you. Um, uh, this is really early days, folks. So when you say how are you, how are you tracking these changes? Right now we're not tracking the changes because we're this is literally since the beginning of September we've started this discussion. Um, we're trying to bring it to you as soon as we can. Other questions? Okay, let me move on. So we've covered why, we've covered what we're thinking of changing for Pulp 4. How are we proposing to do this? The primary consideration in this entire process is to allow for a measured upgrade path for our community 
and for the products that build on top of pulp. So the proposal is in pulp three, there will be new endpoints appearing as tech preview. Basically, there'll be a V4 endpoint, and we'll get into some details in a moment. Uh, it's still pulp three. You don't have to change anything. All your existing workflows still work, but the new ones start showing up. We will continue maintaining the existing V3 endpoints. When we repackage and switch to, hey, now your, your objects are pulp four as a version, the new endpoints will be out of tech preview. The old endpoints will continue to exist. So your workflows will still work on Pulp 4, but they will no longer be maintained. And the packaging obviously will be versioned to a new version. Um, at a 50,000 foot level, that's the goal of this, of this process is you'll be able to start looking at and experimenting with and switching to the new V4 endpoints while you're still running pulp three and then once pulp four comes out you'll be able to upgrade and still have all of your pulp three uh your v3 endpoints still there while you're finishing your migration so the 50,000 foot version that's what we're aiming for yes um since the question came up with the prn i just want to highlight that this is where it rises and shines when we change all the hrefs in the application to switch from 3.3 to 3.4 mm -hmm. at that point already all the hrefs as references as unique references to unique resources are broken already and that's why we introduced the new unique prn exactly that's a really good point matthias thank you at that point maybe it's worth giving an example it's basically like a repository colon file colon UUID. Yeah. Yeah. If someone would like to grab a uh, a quick example of a PRN and just drop it in the chat for the folk that are unfamiliar, that would be awesome. Uh, and just a note, folks, PRNs are already in Pulp 3. They already exist um, for the reasons we've discussed. Uh, we're just managing it with in, in parallel with the uh, existing HREFs in the places that they appear. All right, let's look at some details for how we are considering making this happen in a way that lets us improve Pulp 3 without breaking our entire community. Uh, first of all, in Pulp 3 itself, first thing that happens is you'll see a, uh, a REST, AP, uh, REST API endpoints that have v4, where they currently have v3. Any changes, uh, as mentioned above, will be in the v4 endpoint only. APIs that are not affected by those changes will just show up under v4. Uh, and there will be a number of APIs that will stay the same. A lot of APIs will probably stay the same, but they'll show up as v4. This means that v3 and v4 APIs will coexist and will be maintained. v3 primarily will be bug fixes only. You'll note I put a question mark there because I know how actual users and actual development works. So we can say it's bug fixes only, but I guarantee you somebody's gonna come up with a feature that absolutely has to be in V3 in the first quarter of next year, and it's gonna appear there. That's just the reality of software. We are very pragmatic on the Pulp team. Um, you will gain access to changes and improvements and fixes to the V4 API just as part of your normal Pulp 3 updates just like you're getting bug fixes for anything else today. Make that person. Um, so in this state, V4 is, appears and is available on your pulp installation. And if you ignore it, everything keeps working. So what happens when we decide we're done with V4 and we're ready to release it? So once V4 is considered complete, and stable, then we will be versioning our packages on PyPI uh, and the RPM uh, work that the foreman does for us. No, we do not own the RPM packaging. Yes, this will require a lot of discussion. You should. Yeah, well, that, that's a different discussion. Might happen, but I, that's not for the purposes of this talk. Um, so I'm going to cover that with a, somebody else's problem field at the moment. This absolutely is going to require a bunch of discussion with the folk that do do that packaging. Um, and we are aware of that. So again, we don't want to surprise uh, the folk that, in, that help us with our infrastructure any more than we want to surprise our community. 
So once v4 is stable, we want to repackage as 4.0. The v4 API is declared, not tech preview. It's right there. V3 APIs will stay in pulp 4. All that code that backs all the old APIs will be there. It's just no longer maintained. Now note I put in except for emergencies. As noted, we're a very pragmatic team. And we all know that no matter how often you say, no, that's end of life, we're not going to do that anymore. There's going to be security issues. There's going to be somebody who really, really, really needs just this one fix. Um, so I suspect we will be maintaining v3 for emergency reasons, even after we have versioned a pulp 4. That is the reality. Just to reassure everybody that we all know on this team how software in the real world actually works. All right. Given that we've talked about what we want to change and how we might want to go about changing it and some details there, when might this happen? Well, we've got a small list of important changes. We think we've got a non-intrusive upgrade path. So how about now? Like we could start, V4 may start appearing in Pulp 3 this quarter. Um, we've already had one really quick proof of concept that had the status API supported both on V3 and V4. Hey, look, it, it worked. We have the, but there is a lot of work to do in terms of uh, figuring out how to make this work and where the code needs to change. We're just going to be doing a bunch of proof of concept work. Um, when might we release Pulp 4? Could it be Q2 of 2025? Note the question mark. Um, we as a team would like this to happen soon, partially because anytime you say, oh, we'll do it in a year from now, then there's no point in me even having this talk and I'll just have it again next year. Um, but partially because the changes that we'd like to make are important, important for our community, but also important for Pulp's ability to continue doing development work. So sooner rather than later, is the current plan. As I mentioned on the first screen, don't panic. <laughs> Remember, the V3 APIs, which is what everyone talks to, the V3 APIs continue to exist even if we, by some miracle, get Pulp 4 out at the end of Q1 of 2025. V3 is still around. You don't have to talk about changing all of your environments that fast. Um, and obviously, these dates are subject to discussion with the community, which is why we're having this talk now, discussion with the owners of products that use Pulp, because that they have um, not, not just Red Hat's products, um, they have their own schedules and their own idea of what needs to be supported and for how long, and that will factor into uh, our, our decision making on this as well. All right. What happens after Pulp 4 comes out? So this is important because the goal, as you will remember from a previous slide, is for this to be a repeatable process. What we'd like to have if, with the road, the road leading from Pulp 3 to Pulp 4 is have it work so well and so seamlessly for our community and for the, the end users of Pulp 3 that nobody panics when we say, hey, we're going to release Pulp 5 six months later or a year later. What would that look like? Well, when Pulp 5 is released, 5.0 is released, the V at that point only, the V3 APIs get removed. They're no longer accessible. And if you haven't updated to V4, then you do, in fact, have a problem and you're stuck until you manage to do that. Just like for the 3 to 4, though, in that case, the V4 API moves to being maintained. V5 becomes available under um, tech preview in the Pulp 4 context. And then when Pulp 5 comes out, V5 becomes the, the API that we maintain, and V4 sticks around to give you a whole release worth of updating. That's the, the thing that we are aiming at, is not just how do we make the 3 to 4 process painless, as well, painless as we can make it, but also how do we prepare the road to make the 4 to 5 process and the 5 to 6 process equally painless. We are aiming for repeatable consumable upgrades. And the goal, the reason for that is to let the pulp project make important changes to pulp that might require very low level architectural decisions to be reconsidered in ways that do not break our community. Questions? Uh, Kieran, the V4 API duplicates the parts of the V3 that don't need to change. 
Yeah, uh, that's the goal, yes. Because over time, we'd like to get to the point where the entire V3 API gets removed, which means everybody wants to be looking at V4. So if it doesn't need a change, then it will just show up in both places. The view set, if you will, in Django terms will be available under both V3 and V4. I have a couple of questions here. Uh, Matthias. Um, I just want to add, basically, all the V4 endpoints will be different than V3 endpoints because they don't no longer um, provide the pulp href. Sure. But on the developer side, I think we hope and strive to be that to, uh, for that to be a no change, because the pulp href really is maintained on the pulp core side, so the plugin developer will not see the will not need to change anything for pulp href to only appear on v3 endpoints right. yeah, that right. are otherwise duplicated. Exactly, and this is an example of the kind of detail that that will become more apparent as we actually start making these changes available. Um, we'll find out a bunch of things. Uh, Odalon, I think you had your I think it was already answered by Matthias. And I was okay. going to ask, why not having a stable instead of a version with a number and a beta? And that you move from beta to stable, like Kubernetes does. Like It works if it works on Kubernetes. That is the must work for us. Interesting. That's a good thought. That is a thought anyway. I think it's a good thought. Um, I have no opinion on that off the top of my head, and I don't want to design out in front of everybody. Also, I'm gonna, we're running a little low on time. Uh, let's see, Matthias. Have instead um, of like V. Go ahead, Matthias. If it's like having a V3 beta endpoint there, I believe the project is a little bit too small to get enough coverage on that to really get it into the fields, so to say, and see where it goes wrong. And then the release is not better than not having a beta at all. Mm -hmm. Personal meaning of myself, or personal opinion of myself. Uh, but I think I heard something like that before. OK. Well, on, did that answer your question? I think it did. It did. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to move along. Oh, wait, I have an hour. This is perfect. OK, we're good. Thank you, Tanya. I, yes. Thank you for keeping my brain on track. Um, what's the catch? OK, the catch here is, first of all, before any of this can happen, because one of the changes we want to make is have pulp be always domain enabled. That requires all our plugins to be domain aware. Now, those of you that were paying attention, we just had a great talk moments ago on where we are currently with domains. Uh, and there are plugins, there are four plugins that really need to be domain aware since they're, the, they're among the ones that we release in our OCI images. And that work has to happen before we can really make this happen. Um, uh, Jared listed them. The the big ones that have yet to be done are container, which he is currently working on. And then Deb needs work, and that's going to be a complicated one. And Ansible needs work, and that's going to be a complicated one. And then Maven is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, but we need to get those four done um, and, and, and domain enabled. Another catch. Maintaining the two sides of this, the, both the V3 and the V4 API, requires duplicate work on the maintainers, which is us. Uh, so if a bug happens in some API, it's going to affect both the V4 implementation and the V3 implementation. And that's extra, extra developer time, if you will. Um, and we are a little stretched right now. So that's going to be an issue for us. Um, is how does the pulp team manage to keep everybody happy and keep ourselves sane? And obviously, the longer pulp three is in active, you know, that that pulp three API and the pulp three packaging um, is current and is taking bug fixes and especially taking feature requests, the worse that will be on the pulp team. That one is difficult to address, other than, okay, everybody, pulp four is out. Please move to it, and then we'll stop maintaining pulp three. Um, 
very difficult to get everyone to do that. As anyone of you who are experienced in supported software know, at some point there's going to be still users that are going to be running two-year-old code and wanting us to add features to it. Um, but what we will ask as we start down this process is people think about your own migration needs earlier than later. Um, yeah, thanks, Kieran. We did leave, I'm leaving, Kieran mentioned there's no scheduled talk after mine, partially because I wanted to leave plenty of time for people to get all of their panic and angst out before we move on from this subject. Um, if you are interested in seeing V4's changes happen sooner rather than later and, and helping relieve some of the stress on the pulp team, as always, pull requests are gratefully accepted from anyone who wants to contribute to the project. Things we need to think about. I added this slide actually yesterday, and I don't think the pulp team itself has even seen this. Um, how are plugins affected? Matthias addressed this to some degree. There are changes that we can make where the plugin writer is just going to get them for free because a lot of this work is going to happen in core. However, the more complicated your plugin is and the more not core you are, the more likely you are to have to actually make changes. I personally have not given, uh, have not investigated at all where the plugin API will be affected by this. And that's a thing that we have to flatten uh, before we get very far. So that's that's on the, the team and the community to investigate that. Um, another thing to think about, and this is actually the result of me having gone to a conference here locally in Raleigh called All Things Open, which is an open source conference that happens every year. If you're here locally, highly recommend. Um, and talking with uh, some reps from a company that actually does specializes in uh, helping consulting companies with their API needs. Um, one of their comments was one of the things that helps the most when you're doing a migration like this is have scripting, have a migration helper for your users to help get them off of the old API and onto the new API. So we might want to take a look at what that might look like. And we have users that, that access the REST API in a multitude of ways. There are the client bindings. A lot of people are using those. Uh, anyone using pulp glue, which is very helpful for the for Python users. And then we have users that just use, say, the requests library and goes just make straight HTTP get and post calls. Um, it would be great to have some scripting that one could run on one's existing uh, workflow tools and scripts and product that would at least do a first cut at switching you from the V3 to the V4 API. Um, we as a team have not thought about that at all. As I said, I put this slide in here literally yesterday, uh, but it's a thing that I think would help. And folk that have, that are using Pulp, um, I would love to have some thoughts or uh, some uh, prototypes on what such a script might look like, because that will make, again, the entire migration process a lot more painless, which is, as noted, our primary goal here. All right. And I'm sure there's more things that we will discover. Like I said, we've we've talked about this as a team. We've had some initial, yeah, that should be pretty easy. We've got some ideas for it. But the devil, as always, is going to be in the details. And I'm sure we will discover things over the next few months of, oh, yeah, this is going to be both harder and easier than we thought it was. OK, so main points to take away from this. We have important changes that need to happen in Pulp in order to make it possible for us to continue adjusting to the needs of our community. And those require changing the REST API in ways that are gonna, that will change your workflow. Uh, big bangs are bad. We have way too much experience with that and we don't wanna do that ever again. Minimizing the impact on our end users is a primary goal of the Pulp team as we, as we move ahead with changes like this. And therefore, establishing a repeatable process is critical. Pulp needs to be able to change, to be able to adapt to where the industry is and where it's going and the needs of all y'all uh, in the community. So we need to be able to set up uh, patterns here that make it possible to continue doing this into Pulp's future. But the big bullet point here is don't panic. We are not trying to break everyone. <laughs> All right, so having gone through the entire talk, uh, let's take some questions and see if I can't calm some panic.
anybody have anything they want to bring up here? Kieran. Uh, yeah, so I have a question and surprise it relates to plugin development. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe not so much from the point of view of uh, panic, I need to do something in my plugin, but from the point of view of like opportunity. So I guess uh -huh. this is mainly from the point of view Pulp Core wants to do breaking changes in its API. <laughs> Uh, but maybe the plugin wants to use that to also do breaking changes in its API. Mm -hmm. And so the question there is like, how, how, when, how will we communicate like the window of opportunity for doing that? That is a really good question. Um, I'm going to take a stab at it. And then if anybody else on the pulp team wants to chime in or correct me, because I could be completely wrong, please do. Um, my thought is, so you have a plugin, you have, your, you have Pulp Deb. Uh, I'll talk about Pulp RPM, which I'm heavily involved in. And it has view sets and they have URLs that define themselves as being I'm at V3. Uh, for stuff that's specific to RPM, that isn't a core um, uh, API URL that Pulp RPM is just responding to, but there are, there are URLs that only Pulp RPM owns. I could do that now. I could, I could produce a V4 right now today and release it using the, the kind of process we've outlined here. Um, I don't have a good idea on how to do that for core APIs that your plugin is affecting the responsiveness of. Um, anybody have a thought on that? Because this is me inventing off the top of my head and that's always dangerous. Yeah, no, we're all designing in our heads. I can smell the wood smoke from here. Um, I think the when the the question, the specific question you ask is, what's the window? And I think once we have a first, here's a first daylight in Pulp Core of the v, V4 API that's very tech preview. It's out there, and you use it at your own risk. At that point, you, there's a V4 for everything, and you as a plugin writer could then start deciding how to adjust to the v4 version in your plugins maybe but that is literally off the top of my head Kieran. i think we're going to have to see how this works out in play and adjust as we go does that make sense yeah thumbs up thank you very much um and just to make it clear to the community yeah we're this is going to be kind of invented in collaboration with y'all uh, as I mentioned, we are going to discover things as we go. Uh, and that's a big part of the goal here is to get a V4 out there as early as possible, because that's where we're really going to figure out where the hard parts are. Um, and so be prepared for us to find out a lot of things the hard way uh, as we move along here. Other questions? OK, David. I had a question about removing the artifact API. Um, mm -hmm. So today we use the artifact API to create multi artifact content units, um, namely source packages in Debian. But okay. we'd like to not use it. I mean, if there was an alternative that we could use, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, but we're forced to use it, which is kind of ugly in our code. Yes. So. Um, I just raised this because like, we'd like to not have to use the artifact API and it seems like it might be going away in V4. Is there, I'm gonna ask this question, is there in the pulp dev project an issue opened by a team that needs to do this, hypothetically speaking, saying, hey, we really like to be able to just upload the source packages as a unit and have magic happen? So I, I could definitely create that issue. Um, that would be helpful. I also think that maybe, like, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the pull core code, but I think there's no support for um, creating multi artifact content units. So I think maybe there's also a pull core issue as well. Possibly. I know that the architecture supports, does it support? Yes. The architecture supports multi artifact content. Um, 
I believe RPM source actually has the same issue where one source thing can produce multiple um, binaries, but I'm a little vague on that. Um, the first, the 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 first thing that would re that I'd really like to see are, hey, I'm having an issue that requires me to do this thing that I'm not happy with. Even if we never do any of this Pulp 4 stuff, open the issue and talk to your plugin developers. Um, one of the ones that came up for RPM, for example, and is actually a core thing is, I would like to be able to tell Pulp, hey, here's a whole tar file of binaries. Please put them all into this repository and make magic happen. We don't have an API like that. And if you want a repository to go from version one to version two, where version two has 37 uploaded files in it, it's a real pain right now in Pulp. It would be really handy if you could do something like this. Um, so that's an exa another example of a place where right now to do that, you have to upload all of those things independently and then turn them into content and then add them to the repository in one fell swoop. And that's the kind of thing that we'd like to get rid of. Um, Matthias. Um, yeah, uh, we have made help file being mandatory. So I could see that every place where you say, hey, this artifact needs to go there, you could also refer to some file mm -hmm. in a pulp file repository, which is basically the same as an artifact anyway. So we have that functionality duplicated, kind of. It's, yeah, it's the kind of and, sort of that are the details, but go ahead. Yeah, but, but one of the details is if it's a, in a pulp file repository, then at that very moment, all the ownership questions of artifacts are solved. Exactly right, uh, which is actually a really good point. Let me do, let me follow that down as a bit of a tangent. Um, one of the problems with exposing the artifact API is the way that role-based access control works, given that content in pulp is deduplicated and artifacts are deduplicated, access control depends on which repository the content is in. D you know, does a user can a given user see and manipulate a given piece of content? Well, does that user have access to the repository the content lives in? Yes, then they can. Um, so we, with, the, but with artifacts, they don't belong to, if you will, any containing object. Um, and so that's why artifacts right now can only be manipulated by the admin because that's the only, uh, the only way to protect them from random users, essentially. Uh, Matthias. Yeah, and another idea that is kind of orthogonal is that any place where we have create content from a single artifact, you can either specify a, an artifact at the moment, which is the one we want to remove, um, a URL to download it somewhere else, mm -hmm. or a non yet not yet committed upload, and upload objects actually contain the ownership. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, sounds like a, a big uh, extra step to create three uploads, upload three very small chunks of data and assemble them into a single content unit. Mm -hmm. that was but theoretically speaking, this is kind of the way to preserve the ownership question and also get away from letting the user know about artifacts, which are really the muscles of pulp and the user should kind of have the impression to move the arm and not contract the muscle. Exactly right. David, I think you were saying something there? Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that was actually my thought was to use the uploads to create uh, multi-artifact content units. This is great. This is And this, this discussion, this kind of discussion, is exactly what we need as a team with the community. Uh, we need this kind of brainstorming to happen, which is why this talk is happening now. And we don't have a whole bunch of details yet. We absolutely do not want to present the community with, hey, it's done. We need to help. So please can keep contributing. Um, you'll probably see a lot of this in discourse. Uh, if you have, like David, you're, I'm going to pick on you because you're the one that brought it up. Uh, if you're having issues right now with APIs in these areas where, boy, it sure would be nice if Pulp did this one thing and then I wouldn't care about artifacts, make sure that there's issues open so we have a list of things that we know we can fix and that we need to think about as we move through this process. Other questions?
I'm sure there have to be some. This is this is a big deal, gang. Uh, maybe one last option. <laughs> Go for um, it, Matthias. Content is usually uploaded as a what is it called? Multi. Uh, the content type is like uh, multi chunk. Multi. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Anyway, like like you can put multiple things into one HTTP request and just one of them being the file, but also you could have multiple being the file and then you have one request containing three files and some metadata and that creates content. Sure. Absolutely. I, I mean, there's don't a... know how, how uh, I don't know how to do it with curl, but from the HTTP side, it should be possible. I mean, there's a lot of implementation <laughs> possibilities, I think. Multi-part, yeah, there we go. Um, all of which are implementation detail. The overarching thing is I wanna be able to turn to Pulp and say, here is a, a single request that needs to do this complicated thing on the back end instead of me, the user, having to do all this complicated work in advance and then ask Pulp to, to do the simple thing on the other side. Um, that's kind of the approach that we need. Other questions? I have another question. Go for it, David. Sorry. Um, no, you're good. It's all good. Please do. Uh, so I we don't use domains, and I don't think we'll end up using them. But I assume there'll be some guidance, like to set up a dummy domain in v4. I mean, that'll be the default domain. Jared, do you have any uh, any feedback there? Yeah. So currently. When you're not using domains, you're actually on the default domain. It's just hidden from mm -hmm. uh, your site. And so in Pulp 4, when domains are on by default, you'll see that you're part of the default domain. Exactly right. Yeah, you can also see it if you look at the task outputs, you'll see one of the reserved resources is always the default domain. Does that help, David? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Outstanding. Yeah, so the news is you're actually using domains. You just don't know it. Other questions? Going once. Going twice. Going three times. All right. Uh, anyway, thank you all. Uh, I hope everyone who heard this is breathing a little easier and your heart rates have gone back down after seeing the title of this talk. Um, we will be very, very transparent uh, with this process as it moves forward. We are going to invite as much collaboration as we can get from all y'all and absolutely as much uh, participation and maybe even pull requests uh, as we can get from outside the team in order to, to get us through this process. Um, and we're gonna work really hard to not break y'all. Thank you so much for paying attention to this talk. I'm going to stop the recording here. There we go.